Thank you for helping me, Marco. Appreciate you, bro. Yeah. Okay. Um, greetings from IAEA Seventh Day Adventist Church in in IAEA, Honolulu, Hawaii. So, <laughs> uh, it's really, really good to be here and to see you folks, all your familiar, loving faces, uh, family, actually, after after the years, all the years that we were here. I appreciate uh, Pastor Dave allowing me to uh, invade his uh, pulpit and his baptismal. And uh, uh, God bless you, brother, as you minister to these wonderful folks. These are the best people in the world. It's good to have uh, the Cave Creek uh, contingency here. God bless you guys holding down the two front rows there. So <laughs> it's always good to see you. Um, I did have a, a, a couple of pictures to show you, but it looks like our uh, our AV, you know, we, we get tied to technology and then all of a sudden technology fails us and and leaves us hanging high and dry. And, and so uh, some uh, we there was life before PowerPoint at one point. <laughs> there was life before cell phones and all those good things. Uh, there's a few people uh, with uh with us here from Hawaii as well, uh, Travis Sager. Some of you guys know Travis from camp, and uh, Travis is pastor of the Honolulu Central Church, and uh, glad to have him here. And of course, everybody knows Uncle Eric and Auntie Jana are with us as well, so uh, glad you guys are here as well. Um, we've been going through uh, the book of Daniel in my church in Iaea. And uh, we just finished up uh, uh, Daniel uh, 1 through 6. And so I just uh, plucked one of those uh, sermons to share with you today. Uh, it's from Daniel chapter 3. It's the story of the fiery furnace. Any of you guys, uh, I, that's why I enjoyed uh, the uh, song service. It's very much about, about the fiery furnace that, that all of us have to go through at some point in our lives. Um, some of you might be in it right now. Uh, but the promise is, is that we are not in there alone. That Jesus himself uh, will walk with us, talk with us, and be with us. So uh, before we be, uh, uh, get started, let's uh, bow our heads and say a prayer. Thank you. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you today. We give this service to you. We're opening your word, and we can't begin to understand it without the Holy Spirit to guide us and teach us and lead us. So Holy Spirit, take control of this meeting, take control of every heart in this room, especially mine, and speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Um, it's always uh, uh, good to, one of, the th one of the joys in life as you get older is to be able to uh, embarrass your kids in new and wonderful ways. Uh, <laughs> And so I've got a couple of mine with me here. Nathan, my middle son, and his uh, lovely wife, Felicia, are with us. So God bless you guys. And uh, I, I tailored this sermon specifically for you. So, <laughs> All right, success. Success. And, of course, my lovely wife, Dee Dee, always uh, there with me to, uh, to propel me forward and to get me out of bed and say, hey, you better get up. You are the pastor. You've got to go to church. So <laughs> so uh, thank you, my dear, for your 37 years of support and love. So, <laughs> um, By the way, we uh, started dating right here at Thunderbird Academy. And uh, so I, I think there's a few other folks here that uh, might have started that journey into marriage uh, while they were here as well. I see... Uh, uh, the, some of the, the Parfit family here, and it's good to see you guys. I uh, just did, uh, was able to uh, enjoy their wedding. Was that two years ago? Just one year ago. They're, they're barely one year newlyweds, so glad you guys are here as well. All right, so uh, you all know the story of the fiery furnace, right? Um, you, what, what we've been talking about in, Isaiah, in uh, the book of Daniel are the themes that, that go through uh, the book of Daniel. And uh, we've identified some themes that are, that are uh, familiar to us, and then there's some that may not be. 
And so uh, what I'd like to talk about is uh, some of those things that, that we have identified and have, have used as kind of a, a benchmark to come back to in the study of the book of Daniel so that it helps us to understand what, what we're looking at and why we're looking at it. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. There's a wonderful text there that says all these things were written as examples and for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. All these things is the stories that are in the Old Testament. The stories that are written in the Old Testament talk about, tell us about how God dealt with those people. And there's a funny thing about people is times change, technology changes, but people don't really change. People are what people are. And God interacted with people in the same way in the Old Testament as he interacted with people in the New Testament and, and that he is interacting with us at, that live down here in 2021. Uh, all these things happen to them as examples. So when we read the story of Daniel in the lion's den, it's an example. When we read the story of, of Daniel uh, uh, interpreting the, the uh, message of, of the statue, the head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly ties of brass, legs of iron, feet, part, feet partly of iron and partly of clay, all these things are written to us as examples of how we should live our lives because God never changes. We know that, amen? God never changes, and he still speaks to human beings. He still works with stubborn human beings, sinful human beings, rebellious human beings, fearful human beings. He works with us. He loves us. He is continually giving and sending his Holy Spirit and the angels to to draw us back into that relationship with himself because that's where life is. Life is found in that relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said it. This is eternal life that they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And so that, that true life, that abundant life, begins when we reach out and take the hand of Jesus. So we see these things are written to us as examples, as examples. As for our admonition, and admonition means a teaching. So we learn from these things. Now the second uh, theme that we've been talking about in, in my church in IAEA is the pattern that's found in the stories. There's a pattern that, that is found in the stories of the book of Daniel. And what is that pattern? Well, the pattern begins with a crisis. There's a crisis that happens to God's people. A crisis can be something that's good, or it can be something that's bad, or it can be something that is unknown. It might be good, it might be bad. But a crisis is something that, it's a, it's a, it's a moment in time when you can go either way. A crisis happens when there's a moment in time when there's something momentous, something that can be life-changing that takes place. And so we see crisis is happening to God's people all down through the Old Testament and the New Testament. A crisis comes into the life of a young man named Joseph. And he is taken by his brothers. He's thrown into the uh, pit. He almost loses his life, but for his, bro uh, his oldest brother, who figures out a way to save his life, and while the oldest brother is gone, trying to figure out how to get this kid back home, the other brothers drag him out, sell him as a slave, and off he goes to the land of Egypt. Now that sounds like a crisis. How about that sounds like a crisis. Well, when we read in the book Patriarchs and Prophets, there's, a, there's a, 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 a statement that she makes that while Joseph was on that journey, while he was walking across the, uh, tied to a camel, across the, the desert from the land of Canaan, from Palestine to the land of Egypt, going to who knows what future would be, would, uh, who, who knows what would happen to him. He didn't have a clue. What was going on in his mind? There's two choices he could have made. God has obviously forsaken me. God hates me. The God of my fathers has failed me, let me down. He must not love me and care about me because he has allowed me to be sold as a slave and now I'm going to a future that, that could be very dark. Or he could make a choice to reaffirm his dedication to God. He could make a choice to rededicate his life to God. So first, number one, we have a crisis. Number two, we have a reaffirmation and a rededication to God because that's exactly what Joseph did. 
he rededicated his life to God for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, for sickness or in health, for slavery or freedom, whatever it was, he rededicated his life to the Lord at that point in time and said, God, I'm yours. Do with me what you will. Now, the third point that we come to is a test, a test that happens, a test that happens to all God's people. When they're faced with a crisis, they have a choice to reaffirm, rededicate their life to God, and then they're faced with the test, whatever it might be. For Joseph, it was a life of slavery. It was being wrongly accused. It was being thrown into prison. That was a test for him because surely he could have said, God, I've tried to be faithful to you here in Egypt. I've done the best that I could. I've, been, I've lived my life with integrity and honesty, and here you mess me over again. You've, th you've thrown me into this loathsome prison with all of these murderers and, 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 and rapists and all these, these dregs of society, and here I am. I'm a good boy. I was raised in a, in a good home. I, I was protected. I was sheltered. And now here I am in, with, you know, shackled with the worst of the worst. God, I am done with you. No, that's not what he did, was it? He rededicated his life to God. And he went through that test. And finally, that brings us to the fourth uh, element in the, the stories in the Old Testament, especially in the book of Daniel. God was not done with Joseph. And Joseph was brought from prison to the palace and God's cause triumphed. And, you know, I've read the end of this book. Have you guys read the end of this book? God wins. God triumphs. His cause triumphs. And if we are on his side, if we are loyal to God, if we are loyal to his cause, then when God triumphs, then we triumph with him. And that's the theme that we find in the Old Testament. There's a crisis. There's a rededication, reaffirmation of oneself to God. There's a test that follows a test, a fiery furnace, a slavery, whatever it might be, a lion's den, there's a test that comes, and then God always triumphs. And when God's people are faithful to him and hang on to his hand, even through the test, even through the trial, even through the lion's den and the fiery furnace, then God's people triumph with him. And that's the theme that we see over and over again in the book of Daniel. Let's look at our story in Daniel. Obviously, there's a, there's a crisis for God's people. There's a crisis that has come upon uh, God's people. Now, there's a definition of a crisis. I shared it with you already. A, a crisis is a potential life-changing moment. It's a potentially life-changing, life-altering moment that comes upon a person. There's a crisis. Now, a crisis isn't always bad. A crisis may, something, may, may look pretty good may look really good. Sometimes that crisis comes to us in, in different forms. It can come to us in a, in a job offer that may come to us uh, uh, as, a, as a salary increase or a, or a situation increase, and there may be all kinds of wonderful perks, but guess what? You can't be faithful to God as you know you should and work this job at the same time. That's a crisis, isn't it? What do you have to do? You have to recognize it as such, you have to recognize it as such and make the choice to rededicate, to reaffirm your life to Jesus Christ. And that will give you an impetus to go through the test and on to the triumph. So a crisis isn't always bad. It could be something very good. It could be a great opportunity. But when it comes to God's people, we must deal with crises in exactly the same way. We must deal with these crises in the way that Daniel showed us, because all these things were written as for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world have come, for our teaching, for our example. And we have to deal with these crises by rededicating ourselves to God. It's the only safe thing to do. I have it on the back of my, on my, of my business card, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It might be your favorite text, too. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and he will direct your path. He will get you through the, the test and on to the triumph. Even Jesus uh, faced a crisis when he was tempted by the devil. The devil said, turn the stones into bread. If you are the son of God, turn the stones into bread. Throw yourself off the temple. 
and show everybody how much God loves you when God, when you just float to the ground like, like you have one of those guys with a jetpack on, you know, you just float to the ground and everybody goes, whoa, you must be really close to God. You must be, maybe you're even the Messiah. Just do that and, and then the rest of it, everything will be easy. You won't have to go through everything else. You won't have to go through the cross. You won't have to do all this other stuff that you have to do. You won't have to be rejected and despised. And, and, and it's just, just bow down and worship me and I'll give you the world. You're dying for the world. You don't have to die. Just bow down, worship me, and I'll give it to you. It'll be yours. Now that must have been a temptation to, to Jesus. It must have been a terrible temptation because that's what temptations are. But Jesus said, it is written. I'm going to live by the word of God. I'm going to reaffirm, I'm going to rededicate my life to God. And when the test came, then Jesus came through the test and triumphed and gave us an example of faithfulness. The devil presented his temptations in a way that seemed to be beneficial. But in the end, uh, it would not have been. It must have seemed like an attractive option to Jesus. But each temptation is dealt with in the same way that we should deal with temptation. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And that's our model, church, son of bird. That's our model. That's the model that God has given us. He's given us his word as a foundation to stand on, as a moral compass in a world that doesn't have a moral compass anymore. We need a moral compass. We need a place to look to outside of ourselves that shows us what morality is, that shows us what righteousness is, what goodness is, how to live our lives because this world, brothers and sisters, doesn't have a clue. This is our model. Respond to every crisis, good or bad, by rededication of our life to God, by obedience to his word, for good, for bad, for better, for worse, whatever may come, I belong to him. You belong to him and live like it. Now, King Nebuchadnezzar, of course, brought this crisis in Daniel chapter 3. Uh, Satan inspires humans to do things that they think are really smart, but in reality, they're, they're quite foolish. Um, King Nebuchadnezzar, out of his selfish pride and selfish ambi ambition, you remember what happened in Daniel chapter 2? In Daniel chapter 2, that he gets this dream of this great, of this great statue, and he sees the, 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 the statue in his dream. Daniel comes, tells him the dream, interprets the dream, and says, you are this head of gold. And Nebuchadnezzar says, all right, I like gold. <laughs> and then he says something that Nebuchadnezzar doesn't like so much. He says, and after you will arise another kingdom. And Nebuchadnezzar says, wait, 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 wait. I don't have a, a, a legacy. I don't have a, 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 a this... Uh, you know, well, this, this thousand years of, of King Nebuchadnezzar's glorious reign, he didn't like that. The next sentence, that after you will rise another kingdom, that part rankled in his mind, and he hated the thought of somebody else coming and taking everything that he had built, everything that he had, had fought for. He didn't like that. Um, they dug up a lot of history in, in, in that area of the world, and they've dug up cylinders that record the history of the kings and what, what the things that are happening to them during that time. And sometime in between Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 3, there was a, uh, uh, a, a part of King Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom that revolted. They revolted against him. And you read about this in the different cylinders and, uh, that, that have been dug up. And there was a brief civil war. And the cylinders say that King Nebuchadnezzar actually fought off an assassination attempt with his own sword. Somebody came right in the palace and attempted to assassinate him, and he defeated them. He says he captured his enemy with his own hands. Now, that was sometime in between Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 3. Remembering that, that Daniel had told him, after you will arise another kingdom, King Nebuchadnezzar decided, well, I'm going to make sure that doesn't happen. I don't believe the God of heaven. I am going to establish my kingdom, and it's going to last down through the toes whenever that is. And so he wanted to make sure that nobody would ever try to revolt against him again. And that statue was the way for him to flex his political and military muscle. It was a warning to anyone who dared to defy him or disobey him. Now, Shadrach and Meshach 
and Abednego, they're just caught up in this. They're just caught up in the political intrigue. They're caught up in, in it uh, as collateral damage, if you will. And many times that's what happens to God's people. It's happening all around the world today. There's political, uh, political nations, political and, and social uprisal and, and different things that are happening and God's people are caught in the middle. And sometimes God's people suffer. And right now around the world in different places, God's people are suffering in the same way. So here they are. They're caught in this crisis. Well, should we just, should we just keep lay low until the crisis blows over? Should we just bow down and act like we're tying our sandal laces or picking up a contact? Oh, I lost that contact. Yeah. It will just take a second. It'll be over and we can go back to living our lives. They were faced with a choice, bow to the image or die. Now, it's interesting uh, to know who was in the crowd bowing to the image that day. When we, when we go back to, there's a couple of verses in the book of Jeremiah that talk about the king of Israel because uh, Nebuchadnezzar had not destroyed Jerusalem yet. He had not destroyed the temple yet. At the time of, of the statue, the statue of gold, Jerusalem was still standing. There was still a king on, at, at Jerusalem, the king of Israel. His name was Zedekiah. When we read, though, when we look, I'm not, when we read in the book of Jeremiah, we find in, in, in Jeremiah chapter 52 and verse 1, if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn there with me, Jer Jeremiah chapter 52 and verse 1. Um, it says, Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king. And he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hamutal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that Jehoiakim has done. So Zedekiah is king right now during this time. But there's another very interesting text in Jeremiah chapter 51 and verse 59. So uh, when we look over that, it says, The word of which Jeremiah the prophet commanded Sarai, the son of Neriah, the son of Messiah, and when he went with Zedekiah, the king of Judah, to Babylon in the fourth year of his reign. What? Zedekiah went to Babylon in the fourth year of his reign. Now, what was the king of Israel doing in Babylon? Anybody have any idea? What was the king of Israel doing in Babylon? Well, when we read Daniel chapter 3 and verse 2, it says, King Nebuchadnezzar sent word together together, the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and the officials of all the providences to come to the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. How did King Zedekiah get to Babylon? King Nebuchadnezzar told him to come, and he dared not refuse. King Nebuchadnezzar says, come to Babylon, I'm having a little party here. There's going to be a statue, and you're going to bow down to it. Who else was in the crowd that day when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood to call for God? Zedekiah, the very king of Israel, was in the crowd, bowing with his face in the dirt to a golden idol. Bowing to Nebuchadnezzar's God. Daniel chapter 3 and uh, verses 4 through 7 says this. A herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. So here it is. Brothers and sisters, the crisis is upon us. The crisis is upon us. Worship the image or it will cost you your life. Worship the image or it will cost you your life. It's a crisis of worship after all because really every crisis that has come upon God's people from that time until this time, until the end of this, this world is over, will be a crisis of worship. Who are you going to worship? Who are you going to obey? Who are you going to follow? And how many bowed down? All bowed down. So at that time, it says in Daniel chapter 3, verse 6 and 7, so at that time when all the people heard the sound of the horn, flute, 
harp, lyre, and symphony with all kinds of music, all the people, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the gold image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So here's a, it's a crisis of worship. It's a choice between the commandments of God versus the commandments of men. It's a choice of living or dying. This is the crisis that God's people have faced, the same crisis down through the ages, the same crisis that the book of Revelation tells us is coming again to God's people at some point in the future. Revelation 13 tells about this beast power rising from the earth that would flex his political and military muscle as well. And this beast would set up an image as well. And this beast would command everybody to worship his image as well and to threaten death to those who do not obey. You've read that, right? Revelation 13. Because that's what Satan is into doing. He's into substitutes. He's into counterfeits. He's into anything that will draw people away from the worship of the true God because that's where life is. So he inspires the world to build this image in defiance of the word of God. And Satan, that serpent, that old serpent, the dragon also called the devil, is still doing his thing today. Well, how are God's people supposed to respond in that crisis? Just like Jesus did. It is written. It is written. Worship God and worship him only. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did just that. They obeyed God's command and they trusted his promise. In Daniel chapter 3 and verses 16 through 18, we see these mighty words of these men of God. They say, we don't have to be careful. We don't have to take a long time to think about this, King Nebuchadnezzar. We know what we're going to do. And our God is able to deliver us. But even if he does not know this, we will not bow down and worship your God. We will not bow down and worship this image. And we'll leave ourselves in God's hands, in God's capable hands in God's powerful hands. And here, brothers and sisters, is a prime example of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It's an example, it's an admonition for all of God's end times people. They obeyed God's command. It says in Exodus, don't bow down to graven images. Worship God, worship him alone. They obeyed God's command and they trusted his promise. They trusted his promise. Well, what about the promise? What promises did they, did they trust? I think in a, uh, in a time of crisis, our minds ought to immediately go to God's word. It ought to immediately start thinking, now what is the promise that God applies to me in this situation? What is the promise? In, in Psalm chapter 46 and verse 1, there's a wonderful promise. And there's a theme in these promises as well that, that I want you to uh, pay attention to. Psalms chapter 46 and verse 1. It says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in what? In trouble. A very present help in trouble. What does that phrase mean, that he's, that he's very present? He's very present. He if somebody is very present, that means they're not just present. There was a lots of people present when, when King Nebuchadnezzar threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fiery furnace. There was a lot of people that were present. But remember, God is not just present. He's very present. And Jesus himself was right in the fire, walking, talking with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's what very present means. Yeah, there was a lot of people that were present. But God is very present, a very present help in time of trouble. That's the point, isn't it? He's present. Jesus said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. How many of you remember Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 2? Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 2 says, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. I bet that one was a special one to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as they got closer and closer to that fiery furnace. And the, then the skin on the guys, that were the big muscly guys that were carrying the skin, their skin began to redden and, and, and blister and then char and burn. And, and as they fell into the fire, the others fell on the ground and died. 
They claim that promise in Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 2. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. Now, did that happen? It says, nor shall the flame scorch you, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One, your Savior. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I'm very present right now if you're in the fire. My brothers and sisters, some of you are in the fire. I don't know your stories, but some of you are feeling the heat. God is with you. Jesus loves you. He will bless you. He will bless your faithfulness to him. Rededicate your life to God. Reaffirm your dependence upon him and your dedication to his word. The test is coming. The time to rededicate is now. Isaiah 41, verse 10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will, up, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. What is it about all of these texts that we find uh, uh, similar? What is it? The presence of God with his people when they face a crisis. He does not forsake us. He does not leave us to struggle against sin and against, against all the, the issues in this world on, on our own. He is with us. He loves us. And He will never leave us. Do you believe the promises? Are you standing on the promises? All of God's children will eventually face a, a crisis. How we respond to that crisis will determine our eternal destiny. Our eternal destiny. For Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, there was this crisis of worship. There was a rededication to God and His Word. There was a test. And then there was a triumph of God, God's cause, and God's people. Earthly bonds were burned away. The only thing that got burnt in the fiery furnace was the very things that took away their freedom in the first place. Earthly bonds were burned away. They were not scorched. They didn't even smell like smoke. How many of you have gone camping and, and uh, you know, roasted some marshmallows, made some s'mores, and then you got home and had to wash everything you owned because you smelled that terrible like a campfire? They didn't even smell like smoke when they came out. The only thing that got burned were the bonds that held them to this earth. And brothers and sisters, the same thing happens to us. When we go through the crisis in the end time, the only thing that will be burned is those last ties of the love of this earth. And God is going to burn those away so that when we step out of that fire, we're going to step right into the heavenly kingdom. And we're not even going to smell like this world anymore. Because all of that will be gone. Earthly bonds were burned away, not scorched, not even the smell of smoke. And they had the honor and the privilege of walking and talking with Jesus himself. That's, that's my prayer for, for myself. It's my prayer for the Thunderbird Church, for the IA Church, for, for all of God's people, wherever they may be. May we understand that when the crisis comes, the first thing we need to do is seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto us as well. Can we, can we do that? Can we rededicate our life to Jesus right now? Reaffirm our life to him right now? Say, God, I don't know what's coming. I don't know what the test is. I don't know what the fiery furnace is going to be, what the, the, the lion's den is going to be. I, I don't know what's coming, but God, I choose you. I choose you no matter what. I, I invite the Lord Jesus into my heart. I ask the Holy Spirit to guide my way. Can we do that together right now? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we see these things. We see the, the condition of the world today. And Lord, the only response that we can have to what's going on, because we can't control it. We can't hide from it. We can't prepare for it, really. The only thing that we can do is rededicate ourselves to you, reaffirm our, our, our desire to have the Lord Jesus be the king of our hearts and the king of our life. So, Lord Jesus, please come in right now. Come into our hearts. Come into our lives. Lord, 
reign supreme. Be the only one in our life that, is, that, that we worship because you alone are worthy. You alone are, are, are worthy of our praise. So Lord Jesus, take control of your people right now. We plead in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.